They establish um, uh, collaborative relationships uh, strong uh, all the way across the university, uh, which enables um, the community to be more effective in providing services. Uh, uh, they also um, partner with uh, different groups uh, within uh, Northwestern University. Some of them are uh, CARE, which is the Center of Awareness for Response and Education, uh, Gender and Sexual Resource Center, and CIC, which is Campus Inclusion and in com Community. Those are some examples that we have uh, many, many groups at Northwestern. Um, they have the, um, the Women's Center has a commitment to advancing uh, not just uh, women themselves, but gender equity and inclusion through engaging. Um, they foster um, the development and individual and collective strengths to cultivate uh, social responsibility for students, staff, and faculty. So with the Change Makers program specifically, uh, between 2012 and 2014, uh, the Women's Center hosted a series uh, on power and privilege uh, that included keynote speakers, workshops, and then, of course, the kickoff for the Change Makers program. Um, for the program itself, um, this uh, heightens and deepens the understanding around social identities and privilege uh, within the community. Um, so when the Change Maker program starts, uh, they start to build uh, cohorts every year of individuals who share a commitment to establishing an inclusive campus across identities. Uh, they develop a set of skills and techniques uh, to address individual and structural power and privileges that challenge uh, Northwestern as an institution. And of course, they empower a cohort of people to act and make change at Northwestern and uh, the partners, partnerships they have beyond Northwestern. Um, so the program itself be begins with a two-day in intensive, uh, usually um, in the fall. Uh, it's a, a, a two-day intensive of self-reflection and dialoguing uh, workshop led by experts uh, in the, in the research-based uh, intergroup relation model. Uh, this model comes from the University of Michigan. Um, uh, Skidmore College and, um, and Dr. Charles Bailing of the University of Michigan. Uh, they designed to supplement and allow information, uh, sharing around the diversity of work that is being done around um, uh, inclusion. So each year by application, uh, the, there's two cohorts that are formed uh, for the two-day intensive. Uh, one cohort is specifically for staff, and then the other one is specifically for faculty. Uh, they initially tried to do it with a mix of faculty and staff, uh, and then when they started um, that uh, initially, the conversations between faculty and staff, it seemed as though that uh, faculty were um, getting um, uh, they were tuning uh, the conversation out because uh, the faculty at Northwestern, um, of course, uh, they, when they were listening to staff, they felt like that they knew uh, all there was about uh, inclusion, all there was about equity, and they wanted to talk more theoretical than experiment uh, experiential. And so, uh, they adjusted and they modified and um, they uh, tried to um, uh, do it separately for staff and for faculty and that turned out to be a much better experience uh, in, in terms of conversation uh, between the groups. Um, so uh, after the two-day in intensive, cohorts meet on a monthly basis. Uh, they meet for seven months. Um, so two intensive days in the fall, and then after that, once a month afterwards. Um, and what we do once a month is we do um, activities, uh, we do 
uh, exercises and we, um, we share experiences within the university. Uh, they share a lot of um, uh, <laughs> testimonies. Um, and the, the director of programs at the Women's Center, uh, Alicia Wartowski, is uh, leading the, uh, the program there for change makers. She does a phenomenal job. Uh, and Joki Kamu is the associate director. Those two are the ones that lead um, the once a month for seven months <laughs> afterwards. Um, so in terms of university-wide, uh, that was what the Changemaker program looked like. Uh, but within uh, the university uh, library, um, so let me take a step back. Uh, there were a total of 249 uh, people who participated in the Change Makers program, and out of that 249, there were 19 uh, staff. Um, so Alicia, uh, she's she's a um, she makes the she selects the applications intentionally. Uh, where she does want repre representation of all, um, uh, all diversity and socioeconomic, uh, LGBTQ, um, all the, all the uh, gamut of, of population that you can have in the cohort. Um, they found out that um, the most people who do apply are white women uh, because they have this motherly instinct to care. Uh, we, we try to encourage uh, people of color to apply, um, people, and so it's a selective process because we do want to have that conversation of um, just not a, not a one-sided conversation. So as a result of change makers, um, the impact within the library, uh, so back in uh, 2017, the Changemakers uh, held their first um, uh, annual uh, Changemakers conference. Uh, that means all the cohorts. Uh, we had six years of people, of cohorts, coming together and talking about uh, what they could do to change their workflow process within their departments. Um, the uh, the Women's Center actually wanted to label the uh, Change Makers uh, Conference, their first annual conference, as uh, a racist conference, but the university did not want to call it that, so they said, no, don't, please don't call it a racist conference, so they changed it into a Change Makers Conference. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, normally, um, as, as, um, as the people, uh, we, the people from the library who attended the Change Makers Conference um, got together during this annual, um, uh, first annual um, uh, get together for all the cohorts. The library got together uh, for all the people who went through the Change Makers program and we looked at the workflow process and I was, uh, I, I've been, I'm currently in a, a two year term on a search committee um, and nearing the end. And we looked at the search, uh, the search process for uh, the library itself. And so putting it into context, uh, the search committee goes through an unconscious bias training. Um, and with that unconscious bias training, uh, we look at all the candidates that come in and the search committee um, puts forth uh, at the end if the, the, the final candidates are appointable or non-appointable. Um, and so the hiring manager is the one that uh, picks the one from the appointable pool. And so when our uh, uh, group of library change makers looked at this, uh, we noticed that there was a loophole where uh, the hiring manager did not go through uh, the unconscious bias training like the search committee did. And so uh, 
we had uh, we had went to organizational development and asked if uh, this would possibly uh, be changed and organizational development uh, was uh, had open ears and uh, were listening to us and then uh, even before I came here today uh, just uh, in the past two or three months um, the uh, hiring managers are now going through the same training as the search committee for the unconscious bias um, so those were key stakeholders in the hiring process uh, and that was a result and impact from the change makers program so uh, aside from all the boring uh, statistics and what uh, what you may have heard throughout the whole week about diversity equity inclusion um, reasons for myself for joining the change makers uh, one of course was increasing awareness among library staff um, about uh, diversity equity and inclusion and then of course just the recent example of improved workflow um, and then the, of course there's uh, other reasons uh, that I joined change makers uh, and it was it was a really big impact for me so uh, back and maybe I should even go further back. Uh, I started library school in 2015. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being selected as one of the IRDW diversity scholar. Um, and I went to an ARL um, annual leadership symposium back in January of 2016. And that was my biggest learning curve of cultural competency in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, we had a, a, a cohort there of uh, just testimonies and experiences of sharing um, very similar to what was uh, said here in the previous uh, session of uh, microaggressions, um, uh, higher uh, education um, uh, deficiencies in, um, in inclusion. And then uh, that was um, back in January 2016, and then my my son, um, uh, my younger son, was uh, graduating in the spring of 2016, um, and he um, he right before he graduated high school, and he was going off to college. Uh, he came out uh, to my wife and I uh, of having. Um, coming out as gay, uh, having a same-sex uh, relationship already. And of course, um, my wife and I, uh, mostly my wife, <laughs> just uh, uh, grabbing all the books of how to uh, support your children in coming out gay. And then, um, and then also um, just during that summer while we had that short time with him, like how to support him uh, and we looked at all the, we, we attended some support groups during the summer of 2016, but they all fell short. Uh, not really um, just uh, addressing the, the needs and how we can communicate with my son and how we can communicate love to him. And then, of course, uh, change makers came th during the fall of 2016 um, and just creating relationships in those change makers of uh, people uh, who were in long-term sex, same-sex relationships, uh, even within the library, came forward to me and shared the relationship, shared some counsel, shared some advice. And that was uh, more than whatever a support group can offer. And just um, learning how uh, just to communicate to my son uh, about how we can support him. <coughs> and even um, solidifying the, the things that I've learned in the, um, the annual leadership at uh, IRDW. And so going through the change makers uh, month after month, uh, my wife and I were able to communicate to him and uh, support him uh, in every way. And then um, in 
the following year in the summer, uh, I attended my first uh, ALA um, uh, annual conference and was invited uh, and was privileged to become an ALA Spectrum Scholar and I attended the Spectrum Leadership Institute and that just uh, solidified and confirmed uh, just how, um, how we were communicating with uh, my son, how we were uh, just uh, supporting him, and even uh, just confirming and solidifying how I was uh, communicating and creating relationships uh, within the library and the university, it was just, uh, it's just long lasting relationships. Uh, and just how we um, just made those uh, connection together. Uh, I wouldn't have made those connections, those relationships without my experience in change makers or without my experience in the IRDW um, uh, leadership symposium the spring before. And so that's my uh, personal perspective my, uh, of uh, the Change Makers program that we have at Northwestern. Um, I just want to uh, put up some resources. Uh, you can even, I put up the URLs, but this is, you can even Google it, the Women's Center and uh, Change Makers uh, URL. <laughs> but uh, what I really want to encourage you is uh, the third URL there, the Vimeo.com. It's a uh, Change Makers um, uh, video of what, uh, it, it culminates into what the impact is uh, within the university of uh, all the departments uh, across the board of the university. Uh, I encourage you to go take a look at that uh, within the next week. And if anybody wants to talk to me about uh, change makers uh, further or any other details, my email is right at the bottom. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gerald. So we'll have questions and answers at the end. I want to talk about the Rachel Equity Institute, LLC. <laughs> REI is a for-profit entity, so I am not endorsing or selling any products. I am sharing information that I hope will be useful. I serve as the diversity coordinator at university libraries at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I am also the chair of the university's Faculty Senate Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, a committee that began about four years ago. In 2015, I heard about the Racial Equity Institute, LLC, training from a person of color at another UNC system university. I am always searching for opportunities to participate in professional development I also look for professional development ideas that I can bring back to the library for faculty and staff to participate in. Since I had an interest, I was told that I needed to plan to attend a two-day training session. On March 7th and 8th, 2016, which is a Tuesday and Wednesday of spring break, I attended the Racial Equity Institute, LLC. I invited members of the Library Diversity Committee to join me. Two members attended the session with me, the diversity resident librarian along with a library staff member. The training session was held at a local church with about 60 participants. The Racial Equity Institute LLC provided an intensive two-day training session, talking points, historical factors, and an organizational definitions of racism and white privilege. All are crucial parts of the training session. Now, moving to last summer, summer of 2017, Dean Martin Halbert became Dean of University Libraries on July 17, 2017. Shortly after he joined the library, he attended the REI training session at a local hospital training facility during the fall semester 2017. He was so impressed with the Institute that he shared his good thoughts with the provost. 
They both decided that a session was needed for UNCG and they funded the plans for the UNC at Greensboro to host the Institute. I was delighted to hear the good news. I was invited by the Dean of the University Libraries to serve on the planning committee for the Institute, identify others campus-wide to serve on the planning committee, and to serve as a host. The, the six-member committee included the Dean as the chair, and of course me, the UNCG Chancellor's Fellow for Campus Climate, who is also the chair of the Chancellor's Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, the chair of the UNCG Faculty Senate, and a member of the Faculty Senate Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion from the School of Nursing and the School of Health and Human Science. Human Science. The, the planning committee thoughts. Now, of course, this session was held about a month ago, April 6th and 7th, 2018 on a Friday and a Saturday. We hosted the REI Institute on campus. We registered 40 participants. Of the 40, only one participant was from the library. Also, we lost six, six participants who did not return for the Saturday session. Let me repeat that. We registered 40 participants. Of the 40, only one participant from the library also, we lost six, six participants who did not return for the Saturday session. Although the session was hosted at UNC at Greensboro and held on the UNCG campus, we really wanted community members to participate. So we had 10 faculty members, 10 staff members, 10 students, and 10 community members. And the community members, each of them, they paid $40 to register. The next steps for the REI planning committee. We would like to find out from the 40 participants using an electronic survey if the training was helpful and whether the facilities provided a comfortable setting. We would like to plan for a future REI training session. After we have a second REI training session, we would like to invite participants who have attended the initial session to participate in a separate Latino Challenges training session that's also would be hosted by Racial Equity Institute, LLC. We will discuss ways to increase the participation from library staff and faculty. We will also look to see if we can increase the participation from other units and schools that did not participate in the April session. To ensure the success of the Institute training, I would like to share a few additional ideas. The training should be time intensive, 16 to 20 hours. Two days of content and dialogue should be planned. Training must be facilitated by experts in both content and facilitation. Racial issues are complex and sensitive. They require highly trained individuals for facilitation. Facilitators and trainers should be community-based to avoid a conflict of interest. We chose community-based trainers and not UNCG-based trainers. The training should not be a singular event. There should be opportunities for continual engagement and sustainable growth. During the question and, question and answer time, if time permits, I will come back to ask you a few questions to add and encourage your participation in this important conversation. Thank you. I'm fielding IT real quick.
My name is Mohammed. Um, I am the Social Sciences Librarian and uh, the Coordinator for Government Information at Florida State. I am going to be talking very briefly about how Florida State University um, adopted and implemented um, the National Coalition Building Institute, NCBI, um, followed by uh, a very brief uh, assessment of how the Institute has performed so far but also the motivations for Florida State um, adopting NCBI over uh, other similar institutes um, here in the United States. So very briefly, um, I wanted to start with this quote. Um, all great uh, changes are preceded by chaos, and uh, Florida State University isn't really uh, an exception to that. So um, here is the story of why um, FSU adopted NCBI. In 2012, uh, the Vice President for Student Affairs at the time um, merged the Center for Multicultural Affairs and the Center for Leadership and Civic Education. So right about the time of this merger, um, the accrediting bodies of NCBI, uh, sorry, of Florida State University, um, recommended an increased focus on diversity and inclusion. There were multiple incidents on campus, uh, mostly within student organizations and also within departments that showed symptoms of challenges around diversity and race. And as a result of that, the Center for Leadership and uh, Social Change was created. So the Center for Leadership and Social Change replaced uh, the Center for Multicultural Affairs and the Center for Leadership and Civic Change. The objective for that was to make sure that diversity and inclusion was integrated in the campus-wide culture uh, at Florida State University. One of the very first things that uh, the Center for Leadership and Social Change did was to create partnerships with the Central Human Resource Department. And um, they made sure that diversity and inclusion wasn't a standalone um, center, but that it was integrated um, in the entire um, you know, uh, campus culture on campus. Because of that, because of the partnership between Human Resources and the Center for Leadership and Social Change, um, the Council for Diversity and Inclusion was created on campus. And this council was put under the portfolio of the Assistant Vice President for Human Resources. Um, like many diversity you know, councils on campus do, um, they developed a strategic plan. And diversity and inclusion became an integral part of um, the strategic plan on campus. So goal three of the current Florida State University strategic plan specifically calls for realizing the full potential of diversity and inclusion on campus. Um, implementing NCBI is one of um, the strategic implementations of that uh, plan. So that's how NCBI, you know, uh, became a campus institute. And, uh, you know, in the past four years, uh, you know, preceding all of that, uh, FSU has been, you know, recognized for higher education excellence in diversity and inclusion. And um, FSU is also currently recognized as uh, a diversity champion in the United States. So very quickly about um, NCBI. NCBI refer, you know, they characterize themselves as an international nonprofit uh, leadership training organization that uh, works to eliminate prejudice and discrimination throughout the world. Uh, they have global presence all around the world and they were present um, in post-apartheid South Africa as part of the country's uh, post-conflict uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example. Um, NCBI, you know, operates around 32 principles. So everyone who is a member of NCBI is required to know these principles. Uh, these principles are in a book titled uh, Leading Diverse Communities that every member of the campus team is required to read and uh, digest. Um, I can't really, you know, go through all 32 principles, but I've listed the top five principles that also represent the sequence of prejudice reduction and discrimination trainings um, on campus. <clears throat> These five principles also, um, you know, exemplify the way leadership in diversity and inclusion um, is talked about on campus. So the topmost principle, uh, that is also the most important principle uh, for NCBI, is that every person, um, regardless of identity and what you represent, is valued and that your opinion um, counts. So this principle is emphasized uh, throughout uh, the NCBI uh, Institute training, and participants are made sure um, you know, that they feel comfortable enough and that they feel valued um, throughout. The second principle is that 
although we are you know all valued human beings um however we do carry stereotypes about people um ncbi refers to these stereotypes as a record player so think about a record player that has a soundtrack on it and then um, you keep on playing the soundtrack over and over again you know on this record player so that's how they characterize stereotypes so we all carry stereotypes about people, and as a result of those stereotypes, um, we can really build effective relationships uh, with them. However, listening to people, you know, listening to their life experiences uh, opens up our perspectives a little bit, and it also changes the way uh, we see people. You know, we learn to understand why people behave the way they do, and why they react to certain situations the way they do. Um, skills development uh, leads to empowerment, you know, so when you develop the skills, you know, as someone from a minority background, you learn how to react in these situations, but also skills development builds mindfulness, you know, in all of the participants, so you know how, um, um, you know, to act with a minority person. You learn to be, you know, not necessarily sensitive, but mindful of their identity and, um, you know, what offends them. And lastly, uh, there is you know, the leadership appreciation aspect um, of it. This really is my very first experience with uh, leadership appreciation, but NCBI um, emphasizes quite a bit on leadership appreciation. And by, you know, by that, what they mean is um, leadership is much more effective through generosity um, than through, um, you know, critiques. So at the end of every NCBI meeting, um, they, you know, the campus group takes time to go around the room, you know, with closing thoughts, and um, you know, thank the leadership for the very difficult work they do um, with diversity and inclusion on campus. And by doing that, it is believed that the leadership on campus uh, for diversity and inclusion, you know, are um, empowered. So anyway, um, using all of those principles, um, NCBI has created what is called campus affiliates um, on college and university campuses around the United States. Um, there are, you know, three main objectives of NCBI groups on every college campus. Um, the topmost objective is to help college campuses to create environments where everyone feels belonged. So this includes uh, meeting spaces, you know, classrooms, um, and all of that. And also develop leadership for diversity resource teams. And by leadership for diversity resource teams, they mean um, a diversity and inclusion NCBI group on campus that implements all of the 32 principles that um, you know NCBI advocates for. And with that, they also offer customized training on campus for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the training is open to all faculty, staff, and students, basically everyone who is a member of that institution. There are currently 23 campus affiliates uh, for NCBI in the United States, and Florida State is one of them. Uh, Florida State became a campus uh, affiliate a few years ago, and NCBI uh, a few years back was recognized by the United States Department of Education uh, for their educational significance and, um, you know, for the quality of their campus curricular. So. It's, it's a very, you know, global institute and they're really highly recognized um, on college campuses. So here is um, what Florida State has done so far. Um, using all of these principles and using all of these objectives, uh, FSU um, invited NCBI on campus. <laughs> And the FSU NCBI team has four main strategic goals. Uh, so one of those goals we've already talked about, uh, you know, create dialogue and make sure that classrooms and meeting spaces are all inclusive and everyone feels valued and heard. Um, you know, FSU NCBI is also considered um, a quick response team uh, for conflict intervention on campus, so mostly between student groups and if there is, um, you know, an instance of discrimination or oppression even within academic departments, then NCBI NCBI is invited to go provide, um, you know, training and intervene in those um, situations. There, you know, is also a lot of work from the NCBI leadership uh, group to make sure that campus policy is inclusive and that it represents the different uh, principles of <coughs> NCBI. And um, by campus policy, I mean they've met with the president, they've met with the president's cabinet, they've met with um, the dean's council and all of the chairs of departments to, to make sure that diversity and inclusion, you know, is an integral part, um, you know, in running academic departments. And lastly, they provide training. So 
Um, there it says four and eight hour trainings, but NCBI doesn't really have a four hour training. I'm gonna be talking about that uh, quickly. They only have an eight hour training, but FSU has struggled quite a bit, um, you know, with eight hours because staff, you know, do not have the time to attend um, the eight hour training. So what we did was we compressed the eight hour training into a half day training, four hours, and um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. And um, the last thing we do is we provide listening tables. So here is what a listening table looks like. Um, it is a listening table. It says listening table and it says um, what's on your mind today. Um, the table itself is manned by uh, two representatives from NCBI. Um, there is a table every two weeks. So whenever there is a campus event, this could be Market Wednesdays, um, you know, or if there is a social event, NCBI puts out a table and it's just a sounding board, you know, so students feel confident enough to go up to NCBI members and say, um, here is what I am observing on campus. Here is what I don't like. Um, here are the challenges that I face as a result of my identity. And um, NCBI takes all of that feedback um, you know, back to the administration and make sure that uh, they are aware um, about it. So we also put out, um, you know, some swag out there. Um, there is a flyer that advertises all of the workshop and um, it has, you know, the registration link. So it's really, you know, the listening tables, as much as there are listening tables, it's really one of the ways that NCBI um, has, you know, had the word out. So very quick overview of um, the campus NCBI team. Um, here is the makeup of it. Uh, there are currently 30 faculty, um, staff, and administrators serving on it. We do, um, we do not have a departmental chair and we don't have a dean, but we do have um, some associate deans and some directors on campus uh, serving on the team. Um, the good thing about NCBI on campus at Florida State is that uh, it has representations you know, from different units on campus. So basically every single you know, major unit on campus that provides student services is represented and um, you know that really is the strength um, of the group because it is such a big group and because you cannot have um, you know 30 trainers you know training people uh, it was subdivided into six groups every group has five members and um, it is those groups that go out to departments and train faculty and staff on prejudice reduction and um, discrimination we meet monthly uh, as a team, it's a very long meeting. It's a two-hour meeting. Um, it, you know, during those meetings, we also rehash the principles and practice the trainings a little bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, once a month, we also meet with the NCBI Global Liaison. So NCBI International has a, a designated liaison for every college campus, and we do have a, um, a conference call with, with the FSU liaison. We're also recruiting for new members. Um, every now and then, someone resigns from the you know team, either because they're leaving FSU or because they have you know new responsibilities that um, they cannot uh, you know do all of it at the same time. And whenever we recruit a new member, we send them out for training. The training is called the International Leadership Development Institute. It's an institute that all of us had to attend. Um, it's a pretty intensive, um, week-long institute. Um, the upcoming institute is going to be in Oklahoma next month, and all of the new recruits from Florida State are going to be sent um, to that institute. Basically, it's the Train the Trainers um, workshop. So again, like all campus teams, I'm not going to spend time on this, but we do have you know small groups on campus that make sure the team is uh, operating very smoothly. We have a PR team that creates uh, the website, uh, social media. The cultivation group basically meets with uh, the university administration and bring them up to speed uh, with you know the way NCBI is being implemented on campus and any challenges. Um, the toolkit develops uh, the, the training kit that is used um, for the workshop. We also have you know a housekeeping group and an assessment. Um, team that I have um, helped serve on. So um, here is the workshop. When they say prejudice reduction and discrimination training at NCBI, here is what it looks like. Um, there are six aspects of this training. Um, it's an eight-hour training, so I can't really do justice to it. Uh, you know, just describing it in a few minutes. But you know, just to briefly introduce it. So basically, what happens? Um, the training starts with identifying 
um, all of the different identities in the room amongst participants. And by doing that, we identify the differences and the similarities between us, but we also learn to welcome people that are different from us. Um, it is called ups and downs because NCBI has a very long list of identities, and every time they call that identity, if you're you know part of it, you stand up and everyone you know cheers for you, and then you sit down, and um, it takes a long time uh, you know to go through the list, but. You know, the very interesting thing is um, we always think the list is comprehensive. I mean, we update it, and I mean, it's as comprehensive as you can get. But at the end of that, um, you know, aspect of the training, we always ask if someone identifies as something that wasn't, you know, um, called out. And, you know, it there is always one or two categories left out, you know, that we go back and add to the list. But again, it's a very good way of making sure that people are proud of who they are, that their identities are recognized, and that they are welcomed, you know, based on their identities and not necessarily as, you know, just participants attending the workshop. And then um, we move on to the second part of the training. It's called First Thoughts. So what First Thoughts means is that um, we all carry misinformation um, about people um, within us. And um, in first thirds, the participants appeared into two, and they take turns, okay? So you, you call an identity group, and someone tells you the very first thing that comes to mind, you know, whenever they hear, um, you know, that identity group. And by doing that, um, you know, participants learn to identify um, not only what they know about identity groups, but also the, you know, the misinformations that they have um, about those groups. So again, those misinformations, um, NCBI calls record, player so there is um, continual you know referral of record players uh, throughout uh, the training and then you know right after that they flip you know and they do it again and towards the end of the training they repeat the exercise and the NCBI moderators listen to them and see if um, the very first thoughts that comes to mind at the end of the training you know is the equivalent of what they thought you know before the training so anyway um, Moving on with that, um, internalized oppression, basically, um, we all belong to groups that um, are oppressed, and as a result of that um, oppression, um, some members of the minority decide to be separate from the group, okay? And um, what is uh, really interesting about the point that NCBI makes here is that the negative recordings that we have about our own groups that make us separate from the group, um, it's, it's not mostly about the group, but it's mostly the product of oppression from others to the group. And um, what NCBI does here is um, it makes participants, you know, understand why they feel that they have to be separated from their groups, you know, in order to feel protected. Because if they are a part of that identity group, then they feel very vulnerable to oppression and discrimination. Um, <coughs> the training then moves on um, to a thing called the extent of group oppression. And uh, what this means is that we all hear a lot of things about minority groups. So everything we, we um, read in the newspaper, everything we hear about um, on TV, um, all you know feeds back into that record player. And we carry that record with us even when our lived experiences you know, differ um, from the things we hear. And um, in this aspect of the training, NCBI forms groups, identity groups, um, represented in the room, so nothing is made up. You know, these are identity groups in the room, and they're all, you know, ask the question, what do you never ever again want someone to say, think, or do to your group? And by doing that, um, all of the participants learn the different stereotypes that different identities face, but they also learn the way um, members of that um, identity group feel about that type of discrimination. It is one thing to know that it, you know, this group is discriminated in this fashion, but it is really also important to know how members of that group feel about um, you know, that type of uh, discrimination. Then uh, participants share personal stories. So these are you know, true, real life stories about um, you know, oppression and discrimination. And by doing that, um, you know, listeners in the room recall parallel uh, experiences, and they, you know, relate uh, to one another. Uh, this is really the most difficult aspect of the training, and it is much more extensive in the eight-hour training than it is 
um, in a, you know, in the four hour training, but, um, you know, people feel very, you know, vulnerable, you know, their wounds are reopened and they have to recall all of these um, difficult experiences. And it is difficult for the trainers, let alone um, the participants. And the last, you know, aspect of the training is skills development. So how do you, you know, um, behave when you're in a situation of discrimination and oppression. But most importantly, it's also bystander um, intervention. So if you're just in a space and you're observing all of this, how do you respond? Um, it is a very effective bystander training. I have learned a lot from it. Um, do participants really practice it? I mean, how, how comfortable do people feel, you know, stepping up um, if they experience, you know, discrimination and oppression is something else, you know, that we have to talk about, but at least, you know, they're trained um, how to behave in those situations. So a very quick assessment, um, you know, just for the sake of comprehensiveness, I decided to use the 2017 statistics. So this is um, fall, uh, spring, fall. Um, you know, of 2017. So far, there has been 17 of these four-hour workshops, and there has been only one of the eight-hour workshop. Uh, we've already talked about that. Um, there are 306 participants, and these include uh, students, faculty, and administrators. Um, six units um, have been covered in, in, on campus. And when we say units, what this means is NCBI goes to the college and trains everyone that is available for the training um, at the time. But there are also one-off trainings where people just register for it. You just register and you show up. It, um, the training is not tied to a specific department on campus. It is just a campus-wide um, training. The Florida State University Libraries just had hours. Um, uh, in March and uh, in April, so we had two separate trainings, and um, you know, close to 50% of people in the library um, were able to attend those. So here, are, you know, quick, um, you know, assessment that we get about uh, the workshop. So so far, um, close to you know, 97% of participants believe that the um, that the workshop um, is applicable to their professional role um, at Florida State. Um, the feedback that we get about um, application at Florida State of the NCBI workshop is really the highest rating that we've received um, on all of the different aspects of the workshop that have been assessed uh, so far. <laughs> Uh, the second part is, um, is the workshop applicable to your personal development? And this is really important because participants learn, you know, mindfulness that they take with them, um, with them even outside uh, of Florida State. So there is a lot of personal growth um, attending these trainings as well. Um, the third, you know, um, data here is, is enough time, um, you know, available for the workshop. And um, you can see there that the numbers are a little bit different. So some people strongly agree because uh, they do not want to be in the room for more than four hours, but others disagree. Uh, you know, others disagree because they're really interested and they want to learn more. But um, again, NCBI does not have a four-hour workshop. So basically, it's an eight-hour workshop compressed um, into a four-hour um, training. Um, regardless of all of that, people are, you know, very satisfied uh, with the training. Um, you know, huge numbers agree or strongly agree that, um, you know, the uh, the workshop is relevant. We also assess the facilitators. So the one good thing about uh, the facilitators is that they come from different identity groups. And as a result of that, they relate to the participants and they relate to the issues that they talk about. And, um, you know, this really helps, uh, you know, the effectiveness of the training overall. And participants uh, believe that, you uh, Facilitators are, you know, hugely interested in, in issues of diversity and inclusion. NCBI also takes a lot of steps uh, to be sensitive to participant needs. And um, again, 89% strongly agree that NCBI is sensitive um, to their one-on-one -on -one needs. Uh, the overall performance of the facilitators is the highest rating um, that we get in any of our assessment categories, and that includes the workshops and the facilitators. So people are really impressed with the overall performance of um, the facilitators. So very quick impacts on campus. Um, I was asked to mention, you know, quick impacts and, and challenges. I believe the biggest impact is empowerment. You know, people learn and, and they um, learn to be comfortable talking about diversity and inclusion and taking all of that back uh, to their department. There is also a lot of collaboration that takes place during these trainings. Um, there is a lot of sharing that, that happens and people build communities through that. 
and we've seen collaborations between student groups and between departments that really never existed before um, the NCBI trainings were conducted. Uh, there is a lot of energy and change um, on campus. Uh, there is much more conversations around diversity and inclusion than there was really before um, NCBI. And um, you know, the skills training part of it, we are always learning. So the NCBI curriculum, you know, and I struggle with this a little bit, but it's a tree model. So it's it's customized to the individual. It doesn't really question, you know, the power structures that exist. It, it's it's how you as an individual, you know, uh, learn, you know, to deal with issues of discrimination and prejudice. But um, I guess you can, you know, empower, you know, multiple trees in the forest and, you know, keep on going on with that until the entire forest is um, diverse and inclusive. But um, again, and the, uh, the very last uh, impact is uh, building communities, you know, again, sh you know, sharing all of that pain builds communities. So some of the challenges are uh, discomfort with sharing. Um, it is it is a very difficult, um, you know, four hours uh, for those participants. Not everyone feels comfortable, you know, uh, reopening their wounds. Uh, there is a lot of emotional experience and people are not necessarily ready for that uh, before the training. Um, some participants, and this was um, in the comment section of the Qualtrics survey that was sent out, some participants felt that they were pressured to attend from their supervisors. So, um, I mean, I don't think there is anything wrong, you know, for you to be pressured, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to be inclusive. But I think this is really important for NCBI because they want to make sure that, you know, everyone in the room is there voluntarily and that they're, you know, happy to be there. Uh, time constraints, it's really hard, you know, for people to leave their work for eight hours um, to go attend the training. There is a lot of guilt and apathy, you know, we've all sometimes unconsciously, um, you know, discriminated against people and, you know, we participants come to terms, you know, with those, um, you know, guilt. And it's, it's also really interesting how um, they build bonds, you know, like people in the same space, you you really never know the challenges people face, you know, like you see someone smiling and you think they're all happy, but, you know, these trainings, you know, really open up um, people's experiences and it's too much information to absorb, you know, in a very short time. Um, again, four hours versus eight hours we've talked about. And lastly, the um, expected outcomes, you know, what really is, is, is the outcome of, of this whole, um, you know, NCBI thing? You know, there are um, many advantages to it, but we've had some very strong feedback from some participants that it is one thing for you to bring minorities together and talk about issues of um, discrimination and, and oppression and really get down to the reasons why identities um, are still shaped and affected uh, by the racial consequences of the past that, you know, they continue to relieve every single day of their lives. However, um, that experience only, you know, brings uh, a partial degree of closure uh, to the participants. And the reason for that is because in reality, nothing has changed, you know, beyond their ability for them uh, to open up and, and support each other. But the embedded structures, you know, of inequalities and, and discrimination and the systems and the people involved, you know, in discrimination remain. So even after the training, they go back, you know, to the real world and relive all of these experiences all over again. So um, I guess they learn how to deal with it, but, you know, some participants have come to the training expecting um, to find, you know, a lifelong solution to inclusion and NCBI doesn't really have um, an answer to that. So that's really everything I have. Um, thank you very much. Three different examples of courageous conversations. Before we start the question asked answers uh, portion, can we give them another round of applause for everybody? Thank, thank you for that. Okay, so for Q and A, just make note of the microphones in the room. There's one here, one in the middle, and then one in the back. So please feel free to um, use the microphones. And I think. Gerald's going to start off. Do you Does anybody have any questions they want to ask first? And then we're going to go into the second part.
and um, I feel like at least two, if not all three of you, talked about diversity programs where you brought in an outside company or unit to help you with that. Do you think that it's better to bring in someone from the outside instead of using a homegrown system? Or do you think that it varies from campus to campus depending on the size and student body and employees that you're working with? I'll speak. I know my planning committee, we wanted an outside group. We didn't want any conflict of interest. Also, when we looked at who attended the 40, the provost wanted to attend. She was really excited. I knew that, you know, I'm not sure I'd want to be talking about topics like this with the provost in the room. But I really would like to her to get this training. I just feel like she's going to have to probably go outside the state or somewhere else where people don't know. But, but I'm glad she wants to. And you understand. But, but I think people, are, I'm glad I went to the church. And I'm glad that um, even though there were people from UNCG, some faculty, there were more people who didn't know me, and I had a chance to get to know them. Actually, one of the former chancellors from North Carolina A&T State University was in that audience. Many people might not have known that because it was many years ago, but I knew it, and it was great to have him in there and his wisdom, too. But, but like I said, I think it depends on your campus and the money and budget and stuff like that, because this one, you know, things like that are not cheap, but the need is there. The need is there. We're a minority serving institution right now, so I know the chancellor and the provost discuss this all the time, and that's why they said, let's try this. But like I said, I know she would love to go. Anybody else? Yeah, I was going to, I was going to add, um, you know, it's, Changemakers is uh, possibly a hybrid. It's outside the library, but it's within the university, so it's really supported by uh, the university leaders, um, and then uh, when library staff attended it, uh, we didn't know most of the people that worked at the university, so there was some an a level of anim anonymity uh, there as well. Uh, but during the Changemakers program, we did get together uh, within our departments uh, to talk about the, the internal issues. Uh, aside from the university level issues. I have to speak. Uh, is, so about NCBI, uh, I think it's also about creating a community. So there are 23 college campuses and uh, bringing an outside institute like NCBI to Florida State helps FSU become part of that community. Uh, all 23 FSU, um, all 23 NCBI campus affiliates meet once a year. Uh, so there is a huge conference that they all meet and they provide support to each other. So I think that's one of the advantages of having an outside institute than, um, you know, something from, from in-house. Hi, thanks for your presentation. I'm a graduate of FSU Mohammed, and I work at UF. So my question is, both of those schools have experienced issues with Greek life organizations, and these are organizations that indoctrinate and are often quite exclusive and not terribly diverse. Did you have any participants from these organizations? And I know you said that NCBI doesn't address the structural issues, and that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas how you might address some of the issues that are in those organizations? Um, well, campus policy, um, you know, the way NCBI influences campus, uh, sorry, campus policy is one of those. I, I do not know um, offhand if there was any of the participants from uh, Greek life on campus. Uh, there might have been. Um, there wasn't anyone from uh, a campus Greek life in, in the trainings that I uh, facilitated because I've only uh, facilitated departmental-wide trainings and not the campus-wide um, trainings. But again, NCBI, um, you know, has representatives on uh, the Council for Diversity and Inclusion on campus. Um, that council is administered uh, by the Vice President for Human Resources, and NCBI also meets quite a bit, uh, you know, with the President and with the Dean's Council. And um, again, 
that could be part of uh, the work that we have to do in addressing those structural challenges um, in the sense that we influence campus uh, policy and make sure that there is, um, you know, a, an equitable environment for everyone um, on campus. Thank you for the panel. Um, I would love to hear um, everybody's kind of perspective on what Mohammed was kind of closing with in his piece of the um, talk. So, you know, we're really interested at, in my library about, you know, do we focus training on the forest or the trees, as you put it? Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it's my sense from the Racial Equality Institute that it's much more about the structural history of white supremacy in the United States. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure about change makers. We heard Mohammed say that it's much more kind of a practical training that NCBI <laughs> offers that's at the individual level. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you had greater participation at NCBI because people felt like I can take this right back to my office or back home and, and um, know exactly how to you know, comport myself or, mm -hmm. or at least feel like I have some sense of how to do that. Um, whereas maybe with the REI training, um, it's harder for them to understand how to apply it. Um, but you know, I see value in both. And so I just love to hear your perspectives on, on that issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I wouldn't really say that was the reason why uh, people participated in, in NCBI. Um, I think uh, minorities on campus uh, needed the space and, you know, the environment to actually talk about these issues as we all have been talking about it here. Um, some of that space existed in the past, but not in the way that NCBI brings it on campus. So um, there is, you know, uh, the curiosity aspect um, of it, you know, like what is NCBI, what do they do, what am I going to, um, you know, pra uh, uh, benefit from it. But also NCBI uh, works very closely with registered student organizations on campus, and this includes uh, minority students. Uh, they feel like NCBI creates the space for them to be empowered and address the issues that they face on campus. Um, sometimes they don't feel very comfortable themselves going directly to the administrators, and NCBI has been used as you know the space where um, you know they feel comfortable enough to make that um, known. Um, outside of that, uh, with regards to the tree and the forest model, um, again, I don't you know I can't really address that. Yeah. I think what I'll, t to address it, at UNC Greensboro, where I am, I've been there 20 years. Within the past seven years, we've had three different chancellors and three different provosts and three different deans of the library. Now, we lost some enrollment, but now we're getting ready to go over 20,000, and we are a minority-serving institution. So I know in all the meetings their discussion on this topic. And so I was very pleased to see our dean and what he's doing and with the provost. So now, will that get people to attend? I'm not quite sure. But definitely, the impetus is there. And so I know that that's one of the things that I'm noticing, and, and I'm definitely going to put some things up front to help with that. But I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. But definitely, I'll do my part. I feel good about what I'm doing, too. So I hope, I hope that answered a little bit. Yeah, with, with Changemakers, um, our hope is uh, going beyond the, the scale we saw earlier in the week of going beyond uh, symbolic and pioneers and coming to create a community of critical mass. And once we reach critical mass, uh, then we can uh, look beyond those trees and look at the forest as a whole. So. What I'd like to ask, I'm going to, I, I have questions here that I would love for all of you to get together at your tables to talk about and then probably about 10 minutes and then basically, you know, give some ideas that we can share with each other. The first question, what are you doing for yourself to facilitate courageous conversations in addition to attending this symposium? The second question, what are you doing in your library to seek strategies for organizational development and for facilitating courageous conversations? Third, to facilitate courageous conversations in your library, 
Should it be mandatory, by choice, or done another way? Also, what would you suggest to encourage participation until the training is completed? And then fourth, what else have you done to benefit equity, diversity, <laughs> and inclusion efforts in your library and for yourself? Slow down. Oh, did I go fast? <laughs> I'll read them again. I'll read them again. <laughs> what are you doing for yourself to facilitate courageous conversations in addition to attending this symposium? I'm going to type them up for you, too, so you guys can see them. Okay. Yeah, is that okay? okay. So do you guys want to, you could start with question one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to mess up. In a we'll have them up. <coughs> do you need it repeated? The first question? Should, should it? Okay. <laughs> Very good. We had enough time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we had enough time. <laughs> but yeah, this was just a backup, and so I wasn't sure how the town was going to go. And I thought we might like to hear what you said. So I mean, I wanted to ask. Well, I wanted to get to. Where's the. Uh, uh, for this? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not there. No, but can you open up the word program for me? Yeah, that's why. So I wasn't sure which one. Destroys. Destroys. Is it that one? No. Don't take it. Or. So you know, what are you doing? Work like this too? Yeah, it's a cool one. It's actually it's mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to make it up. Okay. I am leaving. Can you see it? You know, we still have a lecture series for university libraries and the library school. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you my card. Um, we may want to bring you and Emily back to talk because um, you could talk about this or something and she could talk about that. Especially with, you know, we, she did a lot of work with Natalie when she was there with us. And so, um, mention this that we talk. Okay, I would. I would. You know, we, we may want to bring y'all back. You know, we'll, if anything, we'll stay in touch. Yes. And I'll uh, ask you and her to kind of put together a proposal or something. Okay. All right. Which we may have that. And probably have y'all talk to the class. <laughs> and we have a big program. And, right and so forth. Yeah. It would be really nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I remember her. And I remember, you know. I knew that Natalie's been in touch with her. Yes, I think I've yes. seen a few emails yes, before. Yeah. She's in Los Angeles. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I saw her uh, because I went to the World of Everyone. There was um, an IRDL Institute for Research Design and Librarianship. Mm -hmm. She was there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I went to the I think we've been trying to figure out how to do it. It's so great that you you know, as a person, like, everywhere we go, uh, I, I imagine that I think it would be They're doing a lot better than that. Yeah. You're right. You know, like, it is really interesting. The library schools have, you know, such a, a diverse person in so many different places. Mm -hmm. During ALA in Chicago, we had a reunion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. We had a CG 
Irene and Irene. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. she helped me mm -hmm. um, together and uh, we met at one of the vendor events, mm -hmm. um, which was in uh, the Art Museum in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, so we met there and we had drinks and food. I mean, it was a fantastic time. Yeah, we took pictures and we uh, shared some of them. And I think on the LIS Facebook page. So it's great. You know that, um, did you know that Darnisha, she's here, Darnisha Baker Whitaker, she's from, from, she was one of the ace scholars, but she's here at this conference, she got, back, she got the money like you did, and she's here from Bennett College. Okay. 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 What you can do is uh, just quickly touch base with them, say we have 15 more minutes. However, then you can read the second question. Um, okay. You know, say if you have a first question, we can do that to We have about eight more minutes, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read um, question three and three and four again. To facilitate courageous conversations in your library, should it be mandatory, by choice, or done another way? Also, what would you suggest to encourage participation until the training is completed? And then the last one, what else have you done to benefit the equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts in your library and for yourself. <laughs> oh, look. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I don't blame you. As long as you're okay, let's do it. <laughs> So we got all four questions up on the board. Hopefully they're big enough for in the back. So if you need to refer to them, please do so. And then here. You can or you can not yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to fall down. That's Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and, and get started and, and definitely, um, it's like we got about 15 minutes, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, everybody sees where the mics are, if someone, uh, yeah I see one in the back. On the first question, um, if someone can go, what are you doing for yourself to facilitate courageous conversations in addition to attending this symposium? And you just go to the mic. <laughs> Boy, is this a tough question. <laughs> I'll go ahead and go to the second one. <laughs> what, what are you doing in your library to seek strategies for organizational development and facilitating courageous conversations. <laughs> There's one. Okay, here we go. Um, I was just going to 
Am I supposed to be up here talking to you, you, Yeah. You, that's okay. fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I was just going to mention that um, the Libraries Diversity Collaborative or, or group um, worked for about two years to hold a white fragility workshop that um, we ended up changing the name of it um, to be more inviting and inclusive <laughs> and not putting people off. Um, but that um, it was held on a day where a lot of departments in, within the libraries have meetings and those meetings were canceled so that way peop more people would attend and maybe not have an excuse for not attending. So right. that was Did okay. it work? Did more people attend? I think so. I think it was really well attended. Of course, there's. we would always like to see more, but um, I think it was better than it, if those meetings wouldn't have been canceled. Great. What, what, what institution? <laughs> University of Minnesota. All right. Yay. There's, right. there's a question for you. So um, the director of the Office of Equity and Diversity led it, um, and it was, we called it um, Power, Privilege, and Oppression. Thank you. Okay, number three, to facilitate courageous conversations in your library, should it be mandatory, by choice, or done, a, done another way? Also, what would you suggest to encourage participation until the training is completed? Hi, um, Jess Howard, Dickinson College. This is a question that I think I sort of struggle with. Um, one, because I think by making something mandatory, you're sending the message that it's extremely important. Um, but something that I learned from the director of our campus uh, office of um, race and ethnicity and women's and gender resource center, the directors of both of those groups feel very strongly that um, diversity related trainings should not be mandatory because um, people who are resistant sort of re-entrench themselves in their resistance. Um, and it might be that sort of at a time later when they hear about things or start learning some things from other people in a more casual setting, they might be more likely to engage. So um, that was just an interesting perspective. I had never thought of it that way before they had brought that up. So I wanted to share that with all of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At my institution, we have an expectation that staff will participate in four development activities, events throughout the course of a year, two of which have to be diversity related. So that's how we do it. We don't prescribe what that is because it's individual, but it is something that's reflected on performance evaluations. You either meet or don't meet that expectation. Thank you. What institution? Iowa. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Felissa Mitchell from the University of Virginia, and uh, we, we are introducing a module, introducing a module more successfully, we hope, next year, as part of a performance review is um, understanding differences, and that's going to be pretty amorphous this time, but next time with the new HR software, we should be able to, to, to assess it more clearly. Um, I feel like I haven't done anything, I haven't listened to you guys, but I, I get, you know, we do work, I do monthly uh, workshops, I'm pretty much just the, the flamethrower in my organization, so if there's something happening, I go, you gotta talk about it, uh, but it still doesn't feel like it's enough. Um, by the way, how much does all of this cost? How much is, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, how much does, how much does it cost? I mean, I don't know how much NCBI costs. Um, that information is above my, you know, pay grade. I just <laughs> <laughs> um, all I know is that I represent the library on the campus-wide NCBI team, but um, that's really, uh, you know, part of the assistant vice president for human resource. Um, okay. I mean, that's part of um, her responsibility. So, okay. I'm not quite sure, but I think somewhere around five thousand dollars to bring that bring that group on campus. Mm -hmm, I think so, and of course. 
um, we had food and beverage, you know, things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Twenty thousand. Right. Can you speak on the mic? Just to, um, so I'm Lisa from uh, NC State, and we had also talked to REI. Um, <coughs> we were going to bring them in, and the estimate that we had come up with was about twenty thousand dollars to have them come in for two. It's two trainers, two days. Um, you know, once you add in all their travel fees and feeding everybody for two days, and that was to um, to have the training. I think for about a hundred people. Um, I think what we've decided to do instead, for a variety of reasons, is to send staff to the REI trainings because REI is based in North Carolina. There are a lot of trainings. So um, I don't know if it's eventually going to cost more or less, but I think for a couple of reasons that's the way we've decided to go, in part for the, the idea of anonymity and people being able to talk to people from other organizations. Okay. Thank you. I just, I made a mistake um, when I was up here. It was not the Office of Equity and Diversity. Um, they did something else with us. Um, but it was, a, it was a man from, I think, Curriculum and Instruction, or CEHD, which I don't know what, CEHD. Um, I think if you Google it, it'll come up. Um, but he did this on his own time. It's not part of his job. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure, since it's being recorded, and all of you, if you're, if someone wrote that down, that that was corrected. Okay. So Mark went there with ARL, and this follows up on Lisa's comment, but then also answers one of the questions, what are you doing to facilitate? And that's one of the things I did, um, is attend the Racial Equity Institute about a month and a half ago. Uh, and I can say it was an extremely powerful experience. I mean, I'm talking transformative or transformational, what the heck, I never remember what term to use and I keep forgetting to look it up. Um, the, the, the one thing I'll say about the Racial Equity Institute, which surprises me if, if there was a conversation, Lisa, that, that, I mean, maybe you were, were you trying to build it around 100 people or they just suggest? Because I, I can't imagine the methodology working with, with 100 people in the same way because normally I think they restrict it to about 30, maybe 35 people, something like that. So anyway, it's... A, Okay, maybe it was for two visits, but but I will say that um, I uh, I had a conversation with Gerald's dean uh, Martin Halbert because um, I knew they were taking it to the UNCG campus, um, and for me, what made it such a powerful experience was the fact that I was not with other librarians or even people in higher education. There were people uh, from Health and Human S uh, Services. There were people from elementary education. Uh, you know, there was a, a independent remodeling contractor, and how the hell he got there, I don't know. But man, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, but he was great. It was great to have his perspective there. So I mean, you know, so you had all of these perspectives, uh, and and you also had, I think, also the methodology kind of requires that there be a fair representation of right. people of color um, as well as people from majority identities. So that 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 also, which is in some. You know, regions and some organizations could be uh, tough to accumulate that that kind of representation. So, uh, yeah, that's all I'll say. Okay. If anybody wants to talk about that experience, I'm happy to do it, Gerald. I'm, I'm just telling you, it's it's yeah, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, that last question: What else have you done to benefit the equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts in your library and for yourself? Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Just as a personal level, I always try to talk to people and bring the issues up and, and bring them out in the open without forcing it. But if somebody comes talk to me, I just don't drop it. I talk to them. I ask them what they prefer to do. And then if they're comfortable, I bring other people in and have open conversations. Great. Thank you. I did 12 conferences last year. Um, we, yeah, it was brutal. It really was. Um, um, we did. We started. We are. We started our diversity per residency program. We started uh, 
uh, high school internship program. But even as I talk about this, I feel like there are real gaps that I haven't filled yet. And so I've got a lot of work to do, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm Melinda at um, Vanderbilt University. And so what I've been doing is whenever an, um, an activity like our, we have, um, we have a, um, any kind of activity that is in inclusion oriented on campus, any kind of training that we have. Um, we've had um, training on uh, by the LGBTQI office. Um, we've got uh, training on un unconscious bias. We've got three different trainings that are being offered to faculty and staff. Um, I put those on our calendar and make an announcement in our um, newsletter and then when um, at ACRL um, um, Brene Myers was there as one of the speakers and um, so I was able to show some of the people the presentation because that that still is up for anybody who attended ACRL uh, last year so uh, you can create brown bags and things like that around different kinds of um, materials that are out there, even if you're not doing a more formal uh, kind of thing to try to uh, create those opportunities for people to get their uh, professional development, to, to professional development <laughs> uh, diversity things for their evaluation. Thank you. It's just about 12.30. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your questions um, and attending the panel today. Uh, lunch is in the STARS room from 12.30 to 1.45. And then the unconference will happen in the Galaxy room immediately following lunch. And before we depart this room, can we give the panelists another round of applause? Thanks, everybody.